Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our uh, webinar on today's Women, Tomorrow's Leaders. All the women we have are already re leaders in their own right, in their own countries, and uh, are leading the way. But how can they inspire the next generation of uh, trainees, of uh, future leaders, of future inspirers, researchers, uh, housemakers? So with me, I've got my colleagues uh, from ITRU, but first of all, I've got five excellent speakers, uh, Joe Cresswell, Patricia Zondervan, Amelia Paitropalo, Anita Patel, and Jean McDonald. Welcome to all of you. The ITRU is a, uh, a recently started collaborative group called International Training and Research in Urology and Endourology. We are very passionate about training, about research, and most of all about working together, which is how we see the future in all aspects of uh, uh, not just urology, but in all aspects of life. Today with me, I've got uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bhavan Rai, who has been my friend for a very long time, uh, and Dr. B.M. Zishan Hamid, who again is an excellent person who is from my college, supported by other ITRU members, uh, for us, this is a great opportunity to not just showcase what women have achieved, but what is the future for urology in general and for female uh, aspirants uh, and what they can look up to. So I'm going to now give the platform to Dr. Hamid. Dr. Hamid, if you want to come in. Thanks for the opportunity, Professor Bhaskar Somani. Greetings from India. I take this pleasure to introduce our dynamic speakers and moderators uh, our, moderates are, our moderators are Professor Bhaskar Somani, who is the Professor of Urology from Southampton, UK, who is a prolific speaker with uh, e extensive knowledge in research and publications and has more than 400 publications, who is also a president of a Petra group, ITRU group, and heads the Europe Hands of Training program. Then we have Dr. Professor Dr. Bhavan Prasad Rai, who is a famous robotic surgeon from Freeman Hospital Newcastle and also Vice President of uh, ITRU Group and he's also an excellent speaker with uh, more than 100 publications and also has many Cochrane reviews to his credit. Over to you Thank Dr. You. Dr. Thank you Zishan and uh, Zishan you can't get away lightly. Zishan has been the true force behind ITRU, has been working silently with the rest of the group members which is Nitesh, Milap, Sufyan they have done an excellent job. And Zishan is the chief of KMC Innovation Center. He comes across as a very humble person, but trust me, he's already won the, uh, the Innovation Award in India and lots of awards internationally for his uh, non-Muslim bladder cancer cold resection. So thank you Zishan for the introduction. I'm now going to introduce our uh, speakers, starting with uh, Joe Cresswell. And I, I'm sorry, but I'll have to take to my sheet because people have done so much that we can't just remember all of it. So apologies if I have to read bits of the information. What can I say about, say about Joe? Joe is a consultant and clinical director of the urology department at James Cook University Hospital. She specializes in bladder cancer and robotic cystectomies. She has previously been a director of education uh, and training program director in the Northeast. She has been the chair of specialty training committee she contributes to the Speciality Advisory Committee for Urology and a liaison of advisor for urology training in the west of Scotland. And the icing on the cake, she's our current vice president of BAUS and soon to be the first female president of BAUS. So Joe Cresswell, thank you very much. And Joe is going to be talking about how to be a successful leader in urology. Thank you very much, Baskar, for that introduction. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon. I'd like to start introducing Patricia to begin with, Patricia Zondervan. Uh, she's a consultant urologist at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. She specializes in renal cancer uh, with uh, expertise in open laparoscopic and robotic surgery. She's nationally involved in the Dutch Endoscopic Society. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Renal Cancer Network and is an active member of national and regional training programs. Internationally, she's a member of the European Association of Urology section of Urology She's a hands-on trainer and aura, 
uh, in advanced laparoscopic training. Besides all of this, she's also a speaker at the European School of Urology. It's a real pleasure having you here today, Patricia. I'd like to now go to Amelia Pietro Paolo. Amelia is an associate specialist in endourology at the University Hospital Southampton. She's the clinical lead for the South Coast Lithotriptors Center. She's also the chairman of the EAU, Young Academic Urology Urolithiasis section. She's very active in research. She's won consecutive research and clinical awards from the EAU section of Urolithiasis for her research two years in succession. She's trained as a urologist in Italy before she moved to England and she's involved in a number of collaborative project, projects. Liam, real pleasure having you today, Amelia. Pascal? Thank you. And uh, Dr. Anita Patel, who is one of the few female urologists from India, practicing at Endoscopic Clinic, Global Hospital Mumbai, and MPUH Nadiad. She has, to her credit, various gold medals in every exam throughout her career. She is the only lady urologist in India with FRCS urology qualification. Her areas of in interest include uh, low urinary tract dysfunction, including prostate disease in men, incontinence, and other forms of voiding dysfunction, and flexible urethroscopy. She is on national guideline committee for urinary incontinence as well as UTI and co-author of international guidelines on spinal injuries urological management by SIU. Besides this, and this is, was a surprise to me, she is a Qualified singer with a bachelor's degree in Indian classical vocal music from Gandharva Mahavidyalaya. Welcome, Dr. Patel. And Anita will be talking to us about parenting and urology. I'd like, now like to announce our um, final speaker, Dr. Uh, Miss McDonald. Now, when we announced that Miss McDonald was going to be part of the program today, Twitter went berserk. A number of trainees were really excited that Ms. McDonald was going to speak on the program tomorrow, today. And there was one consistent message by everyone that she was an inspiration. She's fondly known as Miss MC. She's one of our senior urologists who works at the North Middlesex University Hospital. She served in various capacities. She was the clinical lead, deputy chair of medicines, management committees, and surgical tutor. She initiated her training in the Caribbean, moved to UK, and has trained generations of urologists, and a lot of us owe our success to her. Additionally, she is involved in a lot of charity work uh, across the sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And she's trained trainees all across the globe. And today she'll be talking about her experience in doing charity across the globe. Thank you very much, Ms. MC. And just before we begin, I just wanted to thank all the audience who have joined. About a couple of hours ago, we know there are more than 500 re registrations already, and we are expecting closer to almost 800 to 1,000 registrations. Don't worry for those of you who can't join us, there'll be a video recording of this, and you can always see it again, because this is a talk that you can't afford to miss. With that in mind, I just wanted to let audience know about one more thing. There is an audience poll that will be happening. At the end of all the talks, the poll would last for 10 minutes. And towards the end of the, our talks, we will let you know about the poll again. So don't forget, there is a chance to interact through audience poll. And of course, you can also ask questions in the chat box, which we will take at the very end. So without any further ado, I'm going to invite our first speaker, who would be Joe Cresswell, to share her screen. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. And once again, welcome to our program. It is a real pleasure to have you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Bavan, Zishan, and Baska for this wonderful opportunity uh, to join a, a really, really wonderful webinar. And uh, thank you for the uh, title, How to Be a Successful Leader in Urology. Well, perhaps I'll come back to you in about 20 years when I know the answer to that question. But for now, uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts and reflections on those leadership opportunities that I have had. So first of all, um, a lot of us as trainees, certainly in the UK, 
um, we do leadership and management courses as part of our training and I think this is a worthwhile thing to do. Um, they will explore with you what your leadership style is, how you can make the most of it, and also will discuss with you what the differences are between leadership and management. And I think that uh, I've put down some of the key things that I think are important on this slide. I want to say one thing, and that is leadership is not better than management. Management is not better than leadership. Both are complementary. You need both. And quite often in life, as urologists, we have to do both hand in hand. Uh, but basically, in my mind, leadership is about creating a vision and inspiring others to share that vision and help you deliver it. It's very important as a leader that you encourage others to reach their potential. Management, on the other hand, is how you operationalize that. How do you make it happen? And as I say, without both, you get nowhere. So let's move on to what motivates people to lead. Why would you do it? Because let's face it, most of the roles we do are in addition to our regular day jobs. And I think the important things I've put at the top of this slide. You want to influence something. You want to change policy or change practice. We mentioned inspiring others. And I think that's what today is all about. You want to share a vision that you have and change a part of your world. And by that, I don't mean the part of the world I live in. I mean the part of my daily life, my everyday urology practice. These things are extremely rewarding. In smaller letters, at the lower part of the slide, I've included some things that I think we all recognise and we all uh, think these things are important and do feel them. We want to feel valued, we want to feel important, we want to be relevant. It's nice to have a title, it's nice to have a position and to gain power to change something is also something that we often seek. What I've noticed in about 20 years is actually some of these aspirations turn out to be a little bit disappointing. So I would say the top ones are the ones that are to go for. Those are the ones that really do reward and they motivate me a lot. So what is successful leadership? I'm sure there's many definitions. I wanted to highlight one key fact. I do not think that being in a position, elected or appointed, makes you a leader. It's the leader that makes that position, not the other way around. And being on this committee or that faculty, adding it to your CV, this is also not really what leadership is about. It's actually about what every one of us does every day. And there may be some trainees listening who think that they're not leaders. Well, I beg to differ. I think as urologists, training or otherwise, Leadership is out there around us every single day. It's all about the people. And everything you do every single day offers an opportunity for leadership. So there's no excuse to not get out there and practice in whatever environment you're in. Leading ward rounds, leading operating theatre lists, leading service development or innovation, leading a department, presenting at a conference, being a member of faculty, organising a conference representing in societies for trainees and nationally. These are the opportunities that are out there. They're all out there. Seek them out. Look for something you're going to really enjoy. A few tips, things that have perhaps helped me along the way. Many of them have come from other people. I emphasize that you should take the opportunities that interest you. You have to enjoy this. It takes energy, it takes effort. Do something that's important to you. Try to choose smaller projects initially. It's easy to be overwhelmed. You can't change the world overnight. Enthusiasm is absolutely paramount. Hit it with energy, hit it with enthusiasm. And over deliver, I'll come on to later, that it's easy to be underestimate, underestimated. I've seen this a lot. Use it as an opportunity. When you over deliver, people will remember that. People will remember you. You'll get more opportunities. And one important fact for when you've been in a leadership position for a little while, recognise when it is time to move on. It takes the energy of the start of your project. If after about two or three years, you can sometimes start to lose that momentum and then it's time for you to move on and for somebody else with renewed en energy, renewed vigour to refresh that, that project, to refresh that post. So it's important to know that too. 
Now, effective leadership, again, I don't really know what it is. I do know the things that I try to do, and they seem to have been at least partially successful so far. Be kind. Be kind and be respectful. Others will come at this from different perspectives and have different ideas. The more ideas in the room from different perspectives, the stronger that team will be. Don't ask others to do things that you would not do yourself. This might range from doing the Christmas day on call to asking someone to make a different difficult phone call on a controversial subject. If you won't do it yourself, don't ask anybody else. Help others achieve their potential, not just for altruism, but because your team is stronger if everybody is firing on all cylinders. And then some pragmatic things, because obviously, obviously if you're leading, you're quite often chairing you're in a committee, you're in a, a boardroom. Be prepared. Set an agenda and stick to it. Stick to the timing. That's a note to myself not to overrun today. And every meeting should achieve something. Otherwise, disengage people, leave an overrunning meeting and say, well, that was useless. I'm not going to that again. Now then, I need you to just consider a health warning here because we're going to move on to a slightly controversial subject. Everything I say from now on comes from the context of being a slightly short British white urologist who lives in the northeast of England. There may be some things I say from now on that you think resonate with you and you would share my view and there'll be many things you say are completely wrong. Everybody has their own worldview and this is mine. Many commentators suggest that women are underrepresented because men actively block their progress. And you've probably had time to read a couple of comments here, quotes from other people. And presumably this re uh, represents their experiences. However, for me, this has not been my experience. I cannot recall a time when blatantly and actively men or anyone else has actively blocked my progress. Now that could be because I've got a very thick skin and did not notice, but I don't think so. I think mostly men, women, all my colleagues have been incredibly supportive. I do, however, recall many times when I've been slightly disadvantaged, and that may have been for one of the reasons I described when characterizing myself. I have made suggestions and had ideas in big meetings, and they have been dismissed. And a higher profile man has subsequently made the same suggestion and it's been accepted and forwarded and driven hard. Now it's easy in that circumstance to feel a bit frustrated and want to go into a sulk and walk away. Well don't. Get involved in the project anyway. You share the vision so you help move it forward. There are unintentional things that happen. We're all birds of a feather. We, we like to talk to people we think share our point of view. So you might find as the only woman in the room that there's groups of men talking and you're not part of that. You can feel a little bit left out. If that happens, just bear in mind one thing, and it does take confidence this by the way, it's easier for you to go and talk to a group of men than it is for one of those men to come and talk to you. It's quite hard being a bloke at the moment in this world. There's a lot of context and a lot of background that makes it perhaps a little tricky to walk over to a woman in a room who's on her own and talk to her. So try if you can to be confident enough to go and break into those conversations. Bear in mind that people can make judgments, myself included, none of us are, are perfect on this. We can make judgments based on appearance. Use that to your advantage. I cannot count the number of times I've been underestimated in every aspect of my life. It's a great opportunity because when you overperform or deliver unexpectedly, folks tend to remember that and give you another opportunity. And one final thing that I've already said, I can honestly say that some of the most encouraging colleagues I have met and encountered are male colleagues. These are mentors, peers, my bosses, my trainees, and I thank them all. I think I've noticed attributes that may be more common in women. I've felt them. I suspect others have too. They're not unique to women. I've seen them in men as well. 
But I think sometimes I've seen women who lack the confidence to step up to lead when I know they've got the potential to do so. And imposter syndrome kind of describes this. This is a feeling, it's not a fact. I think this quote has a lot of merit. While you're lacking in confidence and doubting yourself, others are looking at you and thinking you look incredibly cool, incredibly controlled, and you've got everything sorted. It's all about perspective. Seek support from those around you who will be honest with you. So finally, I wanted to cover what I think the phases of change are, because I think there's still more to do. And this is about diversity and meritocracy, something that Bavin has tweeted about, I think, in the last 24 hours. I want to thank iTrue for putting on an excellent webinar that I'm really looking forward to. This is bold, you've got an all-female panel, and you're choosing subjects that are refreshingly novel. Thank you for doing that. You're giving role models, you're giving opportunity, you're giving different perspectives. Phase one is encouraging female representation. And most societies, I think, around the world, urology and otherwise, are in phase one. That includes BAUS, one that I'm actively involved in. I'm now going to gently challenge, and this is a gentle challenge, this is not to offend anyone. If the next event you hold is a male only panel, which is known as a manal on Twitter, then the female panel and the female representation becomes tokenism. There are other phases, let me move on to phase two and three, which is, I think, where we have to aspire to. Many, many conferences have moved into phase two, I think, and that is that they choose female speakers because they know their subject matter. They are good speakers. They are the best speaker or the best leader to deliver that job. And female get speakers given opportunity often shine. I think this not just applies to women. It applies to anyone who feels that they may not be a natural leader. They work hard and they really shine for you. And phase two, I think, is where we're transitioning into. But I look forward to phase three that I hope happens before I retire. Phase three. I don't have a photograph of this because I don't actually know what it looks like. I don't think we've seen it yet. This is when we don't need to think about a leader's protected characteristics anymore because it is a true meritocracy and the most effective leaders also happen to be diverse. And I think probably most of the people involved today perhaps can share this vision that comes from a slightly short white woman in the northeast of England. But that's what I hope to contribute to in the next four years for me. And now for my most important message probably of the day. Whatever you do, always enjoy it because enjoying something gives off energy. You radiate energy and others are encouraged and enthused by it. I like to leave meetings looking like this. This shows I really enjoyed it. This is Bowes Council. And even in the formal photographs, you can get away with occasional little things like this. I want to say thank you to iTrue. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I want to say thank you to the British Association of Urological Surgeons who have given me a lot of my leadership experience and are trusting me to deliver for them in the next four years. And I hope I can do something that helps people in that regard. And thank you to Bavan, who's my friend and my colleague in the Northeast of England. Thank you all for who have joined this webinar, where, wherever you are, it's been my honor and my pleasure. Thank you very much, Joe. That was uh, really an inspiring talk. And again, yes, thank you to Baus. Thank you to you. And uh, uh, we will be taking questions, Joe, so you're not escaping lightly uh, at the end of all our talks. So to invite our next speaker, Patricia, are you ready? Thank you. Over to you. Okay, uh, well, um... Thank you. Do you hear me, um, Bashkar? It's perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Very nice talk, um, Joe, as always. Perfect. Very nice. Um, um, thank you, Bashkar, for inviting me to give this um, talk about training and mentoring in complex, minimally invasive surgery. I think um, um, successful surgery requires study and experience and technical skills. 
but it also um, needs clear thinking and communication and advanced planning. So I think um, there's more than only handling the economic controllers during robotics. So that's uh, why I would like to 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 um, to uh, to tell you how I got here, um, how I got there to to train and to mentor in complex minimally invasive surgery. Well, my background is I'm from the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Um, you all know the country of the windmills and the tulips and the small kennels and of course the red light district. Perhaps um, I'm from the University Academical Medical Center and um, my daily work is um, I do mainly patient care, um, or surgery in kidney cancer, lab robotic open and also focal therapy. And um, as I'm uh, finishing my own thesis this year, um, I'm also a uh, promoter of three uh, PhD students on uh, kidney cancer. So there's a lot of work to do, but I'm also very um, um, fan and I'm also involved in the education and training. In our hospital, we have our residents for urology and um, in the Dutch Association of Urology, I'm involved in the, uh, um, in the group of um, residents training for laparoscopy and robotics and the chair um, and organizing a yearly congress, a yearly a course uh, on lab and robotics within the AIU and actually Bavan already um, uh, introduced me for this uh, hands-on training, European section of Eurotechnology and, and Europe. And I, I thought it was nice um, to, uh, to show you actually my timeline, my journey um, and, uh, and uh, above you see um, my uh, career, of actually what should be my career, and below you see my personal life. Um, as I was uh, born in 1974 and I started to study medical biology because I could not get in medicine because it was a, it's a lottery in Holland. Um, in the end, the fifth time I could start doing um, medicine already finishing my medical biology. I did my residency and I became a urologist in 2011. And from that time onwards, I started to train residents, the Dutch and the European. And I started to train uh, also with robotics. In the meantime, I was actually married, had a son and a daughter and was, uh, although quite busy, still happy in life. Um, um, a reflection on that journey, I think, it's all about opportunities in life. It is, it's all about networking and friendships. And for me, it's um, very important that you meet people you trust and uh, the loyalty in people. So I think the, the, the opportunities you get um, and you can take um, is depending on these friendships and this network. And it's very important to have the sense for the perfect timing and people. And sometimes you miss opportunities, but then probably would have not been the, the right moment. Or, um, but my advice is to um, to make kind of a plan. What is your goal in, in in your career? Where to go? Because it helps a little bit by choosing and and choosing these opportunities. And of course, it's very very um, good to keep in mind that you should that are that there are threats like uh, keeping yourself healthy is very important and the balance in private and, and uh, private life and work is very um very um sharp well for it's enough about myself but um i was asked to tell you something about the training and mentoring in complex in minimally invasive surgery and i think um in general training is about um, um it's about knowledge skills and experience one of the most important things is that you are an expert in the field. And then the second part is that you are an expert or are able to train and to coach people. So while you are training and coaching, you're, you're also learning and developing yourself. So the pitfall is your own learning curve when you're just starting uh, to, um, to, to train and to mentor people, uh, residents. Um, and this is one of the things you are learning um, um, it's also very important how you were trained. Uh, it, it, you, you will take these these characteristics with you, and you will um, um, it will help you or not help you. And then the, the third thing is that psychological transference, because residents are there are a lot of differences between residents and young urologists. 
uh, some of them you might like and some of them you might not and it's also the personality of yourself and the person you train so this interaction um, gives the total picture of how the dynamic process is in training and mentoring in my opinion in my opinion um, so it has actually training and mentoring is a balance balancing the two aspects the technical aspects surgical aspects and the non-technical aspects i call it the soft part because it's all not it's well in the past the culture was not to mention soft part but i think it's very important and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's deciding how how the training will be in the technical aspects, everybody knows the basic training in laparoscopy and robotics. And I think um, for this, mandatory is the open surgery. You need to know how to, con to convert. So it's not only about lab and robotics, but also about open surgery. Well, in Holland, we have our uh, last year's residents, which have a six months differentiation phase. So this is very nice. We have these advanced courses and uh, the fellowships, personal trainings. Well, in Holland, we have the, the, I'm the chair of the training course, um, in laparoscopy robotics. We started to do it in Elancourt, later on in Ircat. And that was with piggies, with wet lab. And uh, today we have it in the Amsterdam Skill Center, which are the m belmed bodies. And these are actually, in my opinion, an improvement uh, because you really have the, the, the human anatomy although there's no blood running in the in the vessels it gives you a more real life um, um, feeling of how to perform laparoscopy and um, with a faculty of six um, six um, urologists it's very nice all these recommendations we put it together in a book a very nice booklet and uh, we are preparing also the non-surgical technical skills um, within the ASUT um, I've been um, uh, from 2011 onwards and um, well, you see Joe, one of my friends, uh, I met her and um, I think it's all about networking and friends and uh, feeling comfortable, uh, being in balance, um, but never push it too much in my opinion and keep the connection um, with yourself and be continuous on reflection with yourself and um, hands on trainings. Uh, with Ali, uh, we went to Beijing. Um, these are very nice, nice um, courses, and you learn a lot from that. Um, and then we have um, in Prague. We have the the Hodis family, and this is a very, very dynamic and nice family. We are actually um, a group of trainers, and continuous. We have the, uh, the, the needs to improve, you see Bashkar, Bogdan, Andreas, Domenico, and together we are actually, these are all men, you can see, but it's very nice to have this group and to reflect on each other. And, um, um, well, while I was the only woman the last year, I think uh, you should never issue this because in my opinion, there's no difference between male and female urologists. It's only, um, well, the best who counts and not if it's a male or a female. So I don't see the difference myself. And um, the, the advanced course robotics, I was uh, training um, advanced uh, robotics five days in Orsi, and that's very nice. And the tip, um, I, I always try to uh, to, to let, let the, the residents find out themselves. I give them tips, but I don't give them too much tips in the beginning because you have to let them struggle in the beginning. Uh, so they will find out and then they will ask you, can you please tell me, uh, can you show me? And that's the moment they started to, to, uh, to open up themselves to, um, to learn the things. Because if you are too eager and want to show off all continu continuously that you are well, the man in robotics and uh, showing how you should perform during robotics or laparoscopy, then they will never learn. They have to go through their own learning curve. So um, that's, I think, the key to that success. In our Amsterdam University Hospital, we have um, a personal training for residents. So on the left side, it's uh, Suraj, very nice uh, resident from Suriname, very enthusiastic, 
keeps you really uh, live and kicking. And um, with my uh, colleague Harley Beerlaff, uh, the two of us, uh, both in one of the consoles or the resident in one of the consoles, we have a very good interactive uh, training. And it's very nice because with Harry Beerlage, we also have reflection on each other. So we reflect on each other and this keeps the dynamic training and mentoring uh, very, very um, accurate. So, uh, um, oops. Um, well, what do I do in our hospital? What I do and what I um, always think is very important that we, you have to know the patient behind the case you are surgery, performing surgery on. I think it's very important that that's, um, that's the whole picture and not only the process of surgery. And um, it's, in my opinion, being systematic is, is, is good to, to have as a handle and always dis discuss upfront who is doing what and the, the, the parts you want to focus on during surgery and um, try to challenge every time the residents a little bit more without losing any safety um, and control and try to find actually the correct learning curve of the residents um, and do that in a manner like a 30, 60, 60 degrees feedback. So um, the challenges I experienced was actually the time in our hospital, there's sometimes less time. So you should balance the time um, um, and let them, let them do the surgery. So that's always uh, quite difficult. Um, and challenges are also the individual differences and personal perfectionisms. But how did I solve? I tried to let go more of the things. Um, I started to have conversations and started the conversation and uh, positive feedback is one of the, um, the key keys, I think. Well, we have something like uh, standard forms for performance. One of our residents, uh, which did her PhD on this, um, yeah, managed, tried to manage the criteria of the procedural phase with a score. And it's very nice just to give body and structure to this training process. Well, everybody knows that for robotics, the key to success is, is the two consoles. And I think what you always should bear in mind is what should I have needed during my training, which would help the resident at the moment. So try to find the things they need. And I think in the future, training and ment mentoring uh, minimally invasive surgery will be more um, augmented reality and artificial intelligence will be implemented. So this will help. But in the end, it will be the human um, the human thing, the, uh, the, the person um, um, who will, um, um, yeah, will give the finishing touch to all this. Well, this is only the technical part. So the non-technical aspects in training is about training a resident in non-surgical technical skills, very important, so the professional performance, FDOR, and also how to perform as the perfect trainer, mentor yourself. Um, um, happily, the non-surgical technical skills is gaining ground and we all know that it's about leadership decision making, so I'm not going into detail, but realize that this is also a part of how to train and to mentor your uh, residents in minimally invasive and especially in complex surgery. So um, for me, mentoring is always to uh, to, uh, to give positive feedback because it works excellent. And um, um, it's, it's, it's not only the, the surgical part, but it's also to give them advice and to give direction to their training um, um, journey they, they are into. Um, uh, what helped me a lot, and I think is also one of the most important uh, things in life, at least, but also in being a good mentor and trainer is that, that you are balanced yourself. So the healthy mind platter gives you actually somebody to um, what is ne necessary to be in balance. So you need some, some physical time, you need some focus time, but you also need some connecting time and some downtime and some timing. So realize that you should be balanced yourself to train and to monitor. Um, so how did I reach the level of a good trainer? What I did for this is some leadership courses and it structures how to lead. 
and some basic teacher teacher courses but i also went to a, like a leadership for women because um, i had a personal coach from my leadership course and she it, it, she advised me to do this leadership for women and i think it has been um well worthwhile because it learned me a lot about interpersonal relations it learned me a lot about myself and what it what my personality does to other people and how uh, you could who you can uh, use this at, at the maximum and um the mindfulness is actually the, the the balance between work and private to sometimes to let the things go and not to uh, be bothered by all the things happening in in, in, in at work and in life and um I also had the knots course uh, because we are setting up a knots um, course. I think um, the Japanese uh, theory about small steps gives big improvements is one of the things I do actually every day. Uh, every day I, um, I, I you, you, you try to self-criticize yourself to, to improve yourself, to give yourself courage and to break the status quo. And I think if you do that continuously, um, um, asking for feedback within colleagues, but also with your residents. Well, it gives, in the end, a big improvement and it gives you a good trainer. Um, and I think one of the, the, the newest, hottest things is the conversational intelligence, because we know uh, that um, um, the brain is, is, um, is capable of more than only we only do at the moment. We know that only 10% of the conversations and the communications we have with people is effective. So 90% of the communication is not effective. So if you are able to have a, an effective communication with your resident as a trainer and a mentor, you are able to connect and to navigate and to grow with each other. And this is actually proven by science that it activates the part, a part of the brain which brings you actually to the next level of discovery and expanding uh, all these networks in the brains, it, 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 it holds the larger picture and it holds a more complex picture in your brain. So this is actually, in my opinion, necessary to uh, train in complex surgery because it needs ne just that extra thing besides the basic um, 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 training. And if you are capable of having this good communication, this intelligent communication, then you can get the most out of your resident. So um, finishing with remembering as a person, you will never have it all. And it will always be a process of failures and success as I experienced. And um, here you see a picture of my daughter. She's always every day reflecting on me as a person. And that gives me a, very, a lot of good things. So just go on, never give up um, and try to be filled with gratitude for what you have. Take care for yourself. And as a mentor, I think, look at the value of every unique person you train. That is the, the, the most, the most um, valuable thing in life anyway. And try to be scheduled, systematic, be flexible, but also take responsibility for the process of learning. And you have to ask for feedback. But on the other hand, sometimes you have to let the, the things go just uh, not to be um, um, interfered by that too much. So it's, just not, it just, it's not just how to grip the ergonomic controllers, but there's a lot, lot more. So actually, that was the end of my presentation. And I will uh, stop sharing now. Thank you for listening. Patricia, thank you very much. That was a fabulous presentation. I just like to highlight to all our non-neurologists and the viewers that the kind of work that Patricia is doing is amongst the most complex work in neurology. It takes skill, it takes courage and great uh, composure to do this kind of thing. So she's a real inspiration to all of us who aspire to do this kind of work. I'd like to now ask Amelia if he could start her presentation, please. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. I hope you can listen to me. And yeah. this is my presentation. Perfect, thank you. And thank you very much to the iTrue group to, for inviting me to this wonderful and inspiring webinar. I'm gonna discuss today about cultural barriers and my experience in academia and research. 
My name is Amelia Pietropaolo. I'm an associate specialist in endourology and I work in the University Hospital in Southampton in United Kingdom. And um, probably many people here will be familiar with what I'm gonna say about because this is the start of my adventure and it's probably the adventure many of you had had to go through when it came to move to a new country to start a job. So I come from the south of Italy, a very beautiful place for um, na nature and wonderful landscapes. And then I moved to the center of Italy where I attended medical school, graduated and trained in urology. After that, I realized I wanted to pursue an endourological career and I um, attended a two years fellowship, well, three months fellowship in the Germany with Professor Lame uh, that uh, helped me in my experience to widen my horizons. And uh, when I came back, I achieved the FIBU diploma. And after this experience, I actually thought I wanted to continue to broaden my horizon and spectrum. And I decided to parachute for a two years fellowship in University Hospital Southampton, where I actually work. And this fellowship was clearly in endourology. As many of you know, when you start a job in a new country, there are different, uh, there are different barriers to overcome. And first of all, is the cultural barriers. This includes different um, features. For example, language barrier is the main one that I had to face because clearly I studied English for a long time and I thought that the academic English I could speak was enough. And living in the south of England where everyone, everybody could speak the Queen's English uh, made me think that I could actually be all right with what I knew. But then I found out that there were different accents, dialects and idioms. And this was very difficult at the beginning, mainly when it came to understand patients. And also I found that there were very variable and different ways to say the same word and phrases. For example, I give, the, uh, give you the example of the very famous urological sentence of spending a penny which means for who doesn't know urinating or passing urine that we use very often and if you don't know this comes from a very old historical background of uk when in the past uh, people used to pay one penny to go to the loo and so on so cultural barriers also includes health system or level of care knowledge so um, it um, was very important to learn how NHS works in terms of primary, secondary and tertiary care. And this is a very, very well built and structured system that works really well, but clearly at the beginning is very difficult to get settled to it and to know it deeply. Also starting doing the on call, uh, approached me to the joy to uh, use the on call blips that I'm still sometimes dream about in my nightmares. Gender barrier is uh, a hot topic at the moment and as we will discuss uh, over and over again in this, clearly it doesn't prevent us women to join the urology work and because actually we can definitely do it and being a urologist is uh, amazing as every other type of work. This is shown also by the fact that there are a lot of female medical students and only 12% for now are choosing urology for different reasons. But the situation is changing and only with our expertise and knowledge we can reduce the prejudice that is still can be sometimes there and overcome the preconceived ideas. And we have very, very good examples in that. De despite any barrier that you can find in your way, the, the pathway, the road that um, leads you to, the, to your aim or to the success is different for, any, for everyone. And uh, the more important thing is that whatever you face during your pathway, this will help you to discover yourself. And that's what I really realized. And what I realized is that very important things 
are to find a healthy work environment and work with a team of, pe of people who are able to embrace cultural diversities, who are ready to welcome, respect and offer your su their support to you. But also having a good work-life balance, including family and uh, relationship in a work environment, outside work environment, trying to discover and explore the natural beauties of the new country you are living and also uh, try to enjoy your specialty and uh, your work which is the one they're gonna give you the best um, proud at the end and also i've been very very much involved in research as you will see it's very important and it's paramount to find a good mentor and the mentor is a person that really transferred to you all his knowledge. And this knowledge comes from years and years of experience. So this is just an inestimable value to find the right person. They will teach you what you need to learn to, to continue in your career. Since I started working in Southampton, I was very lucky and I achieved a lot. And I now, I've now been appointed as an associate specialist in the University Hospital Southampton. I also became a lead of the Lithotripsy service, which is South Coast Lithotripter uh, service that welcome patients for all the South Coast of England. And also I've been uh, nominated last year as an aspirational patient care in our hospital. Since I joined my publication records has jumped and as you can see I was barely publishing two papers before joining this job and I'm have now more than 30 papers published on PubMed and the important thing is the teamwork so with our team we managed to do a lot of different type of work some of them are original research for example, this is a very important one that shows that um, emergency drainage for urosepsis doesn't have an outcome, uh, doesn't have different any outcomes after uh, when the patient goes to have an elective ureteroscopy. And recently we are publishing this new uh, paper that is evaluating a micro-costing analysis about the superiority of the single use flexible cystoscope in stent removal compared to a reusable one. This is going to help our department to understand the cost effectiveness of this device and to save money, clearly. We've also done a lot of systematic reviews, which helps in different type of the urological field. For example, this was very important because we used, we found the protocol uh, world, worldwide to treat recurrent and multi-resistant infection with antimicrobial um, intravenous cycle treatment. And this is being used for patients who is, are not responding to any other treatment or um, antibiotics treatment orally or IV. We have a lot of collaboration Europe in Europe and internationally. These are just some of our European collaborations. So as you can see between Greece, Spain, Italy clearly, and Belgium, and uh, also worldwide, we are collaborating with India and um, Emirates, Canada, and US. Some of our collaborative studies, as you can see, uh, this is the last one, and this is, is the outcome from the local regional anesthesia in ureteroscopy, which again is very hot topic because in particular now with COVID and all the GA complication for uh, stone surgery. This is a paper we used um, to understand the effect of music in outpatient procedure in urology. And this was very important because after that, we started to use music and lights in our department to do lithotripsy instead of analgetic and opioids. We've done, uh, we analyzed our own data in stone treatment in children using laser and high power laser, which is very um, new with these big numbers. And I've been very honored to receive uh, two awards recently, so the um, EAU section of urolithiasis 
gave me the best paper of literature in 2017 and uh, the best clinical paper award in 2019. The papers they've been, um, I've received the award for were the trends of urolithiasis. So we analyzed every, every treatment, including simulation in urolithiasis in the last 16 years. And also in the last uh, prize was given for the endourological treatment of stones in solitary kidney, including PCNL, ureteroscopy and lithotripsy. These are some of the wonderful people I had the honor to meet in these uh, conferences. And these pictures are just about the award celebrations. And uh, this conference gave me the uh, opportunity to do networking and to meet influential urologists from all over the world. I also joined the Young Academic Urology Group and I uh, became the chairperson from this year, 2020. This is a great networking opportunity and also sharing knowledge with um, colleagues that have the same passion for urology from all over the world. And uh, this is not the end, clearly this is just the beginning and I'm now helping with the foreign fellows to help them to settle in our hospital and I'm building a video library that will help for teaching and mentoring. And clearly this is to be continued because the road trip for success is very long, full of challenges but also of opportunities. And um, there are a lot of uh, suggestions I would give to a woman or young woman who would look for success in academia. First of all, find a good center and mentor that will give you the enthusiasm and the um, boost to start with everything from scratch. Dream big, so always have great um, purposes. Always ask and seek for support because you will find the person who will be there for you and show you the way in a very dark um, day. And these, there are no barriers, no boundaries to success. Also, everything is possible. So don't, don't give up. Know that there also is a um, solution for every issue and every, every problem. Because if you never give up, you will find that actually the challenges are just opportunities for you to grow. And uh, sometimes to reach this success in academia, you will need to dedicate yourself. Also sometimes extra time or off time is needed to make this possible. And then the last thing is to jump. Thank you very much for your attention. Amelia, thank you so much. Uh, I tell you, you are a wonderful person and it is not your privilege, my privilege to have you in, in, in our team. You really <laughs> thank you very much. In our team. So, you know, it is really wonderful to have you. Uh, thank you, that's an honor. It's a very good talk. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be having questions for you, Amelia, for somebody who wants to take up a fellowship somewhere and how can they make success of it. With that in mind, I will invite Dr. Anita Patel. Anita, if you're happy to share your screen. Thank you once again for talking about parenting. And I've heard you before and it was amazing. And I'm sure you'll throw your magic again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vaskar. Am I audible? Lovely. Uh, thank you so much, friends. At the outset, I wish to thank iTru for organizing this webinar. And the first three speakers have been simply fascinating. I've literally taken down notes, trust me. I have taken a difficult topic, a topic for which there isn't a lot of referencing, but I thought this is something very close to my heart. At the outset, let me make a statement that urology is the perfect specialty for women. I did uh, some kind of an interview for all the women urologists in the west zone part of India. And uh, that is where Bombay is located. And many urologists who are women are actually from Bombay. And it was very interesting to have their insight. This was in 2011. And all of them shared the view that they didn't feel threatened. They didn't feel there was any gender difference. 
they felt that they were treated at par and none of them actually felt any glass ceiling. They all wore their diamonds and they enjoyed wearing the diamonds. That means they actually enjoyed their femininity and yet they were in a so-called man's field, which was a very interesting insight for me when we as a country have a very small proportion of urologists represented by women. And I hope this statistics will change. Right now, it's just 1%. Why urology is the best specialty? Because it gives you the best of everything. You can do open surgery, you can do robotics, you can do endourology, and of course, laparoscopy and microsurgery. So the best of everything. However, there are issues. And if you are a woman, there are issues. One important aspect is starting a family. I was looking through some literature and these are the two uh, publications that I came across. One was uh, an AUA census study, which was from 2017, which mentioned that about 20% of practicing urologists in United States are women, which is way above the Indian figure. And interestingly, another study from Ireland and United Kingdom, uh, Ireland and England mentioned that about 14% of urologists in England are women. Where is the issue about starting a family? First and foremost, by the time we finish our training in urology, most of us are more than 30 years of age. Thereafter, if we start thinking about family, remember urology means a lot of endourology and a lot of work with radiation. So radiation exposure is one factor you have to keep in mind as and when you are going to plan a pregnancy. When we were training, there was issue about sterilizing solutions, both glutaraldehyde as well as we used to use formalin tablets in boxes which were used to you know, store endoscopes. And these both give toxic fumes which can actually increase your risk of having an abortion. Last but not the least, you have to plan so ahead of time. I remember the time I had my first daughter in United Kingdom. I was doing a senior registrar's rotation in North Yorkshire. And uh, when she was six months of age, I started looking for a childcare for her. And when I inquired, they told me that they're booked for the next two years. And I was aghast. They told me I should have started planning when I was in the first trimester of my pregnancy because they are booked for two years ahead. This told me the importance of planning. And this was just the beginning of planning, which was so very necessary, especially for a urologist. Let's see what the Indian scenario is. India is a very interesting place. We have best of everything. We have the world's richest. We have the world's poorest. We have the urban nuclear families. And of course, we have the Indian joint family. When I got married, I was a part or a member of a joint family. For those of you who may not know what a joint family is all about, right from the grandfather down to grandchildren, everybody lives under one roof. Now, this does have its set of challenges to say the least, but there are a lot of advantages. And I experienced that. With the first baby, which was in the United Kingdom and a nuclear family, just me and my husband, the first child spent 11 hours of the day in a child care. That was a long time for the child. Fortunately, it didn't leave any long-term repercussions. And I think she was and she is a very happy baby. But I think that was because I was lucky. The second baby around, the second daughter, things were very different. And that was because I was in this joint family where there is this ultimate luxury of food and child care being looked after. Remember, it doesn't come that easy. You have to be very good at communicating and the family must respect what you are. I was lucky that both my in-laws as well as my parents were available. So the child care was sorted out, but not everybody would have this much of luck. And we had to plan the child care way in advance because remember, as a urologist, you will be busy. I'll tell you how the practice pattern is in India. Not everybody is in a structured practice. Not everybody leaves for work at nine and comes back home maybe at half past four. No. Many of us work in little clinics and many of us go and visit more than one clinic or maybe three or four setups in a day. As a result, we will spend most of our time out. For me, 
on a busy day, I leave my house at half nine in the morning and I'm not back home till half night at night. If during that time, the child care is not looked after, then I think I'm into deep trouble. This is where communicating with your family is important. For me, it was very, very vital. And I communicated every decision with my senior family members. They knew my conference timings. They knew the timetable. They knew when I would be out. And I was always without any stress because the kids were looked after. I remember a particular episode when a guest was visiting us and in our washroom, there was a fortune plant kept. And he was really surprised. He said, what is a fortune plant doing inside a washroom? We don't keep it there, do we? And to my utter surprise, my father-in-law replied saying that, well, if she's a urologist, I think that is where the fortune of the family is. So it's just as well that the fortune plant is kept in the washroom. To me, that was an eye opener that the family members respected me for what I was. And that was simply because I insisted on communication, which I think is the key to successful nurturing and bringing up your children. Well, children grow and then there's something called as family time. We all need that, don't we? In my house, we had to make a rule that everybody must be at breakfast table together. Because once the day begins, people are out and about on their own and just may not see each other's face till the day ends. This was the time for us to share everything, right from the school routine, the homework, the new projects, what extracurricular hobbies. One thing my children never liked was I was always an outstanding parent. Do you know the meaning of that? I was always standing outside. I was never involved inside the family issues. But uh, I think in a way that made them independent. They do mention both the daughters that mom, we didn't like the fact that you were not a hands-on mom. You know, we used to go to the PTA meetings in school. And in that, I used to be the oldest parent because I was representing the parent of a child whom I had very late in my life. And I was surrounded by parents who were those very well-dressed women, very hands-on as parents, knew their child's notebooks backwards, and I knew nothing. And I used to feel completely left out. However, I think my children compensated and they really didn't make any undue demands. So I think the trick is to communicate with the family as well and with your children. Tell them why is it important that you are away and why is it important that you give so much time to your professional commitment. They automatically start respecting you for what you are. And they are involved in a lot of decisions. We are a family where my husband is a vascular surgeon. I'm a urologist. And often at the dining table, we have discussions about a complex case. And my children will be looking at their notebook. Suddenly, they will lift their head and say, Dad, you need to do an embolectomy. And this is coming from a child who is in ninth grade. Or they would look at me and tell me, Mom, I don't think this lady has any issue with her bladder. Maybe you should involve a therapist. And I used to be amazed that this is what they have picked up just by sitting at the dining table. I think uh, I, would, I would insist that we all spend that much time and especially at the dining table because a family that eats together, I think stays together and stays together happily. This does bring us to a very difficult time in a child's life and that is the teenage. We've had our share of issues. In Indian schools, especially in government schools, there is something called a sex education. This sex education basically makes our children familiar with human physiology and human biology. And that's about it. It honestly doesn't tell them about anything else. Now, this makes our life difficult as a parent. In fact, today's kids are so ahead of our times, definitely, courtesy internet and Google, that my children could actually take a tutorial for me on sex education. I learned that. However, in my practice, I encountered a lot of teenage girls and boys, and many of them had issues when they started being sexually active, and they didn't have anybody to speak to. They came from very conservative family, and yet they were those typical urban growing teenage kids. And this made life very difficult for them. And they looked at me as the only person that they could talk to. I took a cue from that and I insisted at home that communication 
about sex education is not a taboo subject. In fact, no subject is a taboo subject in my family. And I think that helped my kids. That helped me understand my children better. And I told them the meaning of the word of being careful. There are a lot of connotations in the word be careful, but my children know exactly what it means. And I must admit being a urologist made it a lot easier for me to communicate that to my children. Time flies and children grow. Trust me, they grow in spite of us. They grow irrespective of what you do because that's the order of nature. In India, medicine is a family business. You know, many of you will have heard that I took medicine because my great grandfather was a doctor, my father was a doctor, I am a doctor, my children will be doctors and my grandchildren, I hope, will be doctors. Times are changing and it is no more a family business. In fact, I took urology because my father is a renowned urologist, urologist, but had I been born today, would I have taken urology? Maybe not. Neither of my daughters took science as a subject and they both took humanities. And there was a reason probably for that. Somewhere they saw that both of us were very, very busy and they thought they needed some time for themselves. And maybe it is just as well because all the independent dining table discussion made it easy for them to make up their own mind. However, for a doctor, the day is not 24 hours, it's a 48 hour day. And it's no different for other professions. How did they decide about their choice of career? So my elder daughter is a professional classical vocal singer. And she was also part of a reality show when one of the judges asked me, so ma'am, are you happy that uh, your child is not pursuing medicine as a career? I said, well, I wouldn't say I'm happy she is not pursuing medicine as a career, but I'm very happy that she's pursuing her passion. Because passion and profession don't necessarily marry, but my children are trying to do that. And it's a journey. I'm with them all the way. The second daughter had chosen economics and she's very passionate about food. We are surrounded by many colleagues whose children are, you know, they are that ideal family. Two children, both doing medicine, both having study, you know, given exams for studying abroad. Somebody has taken USMLE doing pediatric oncology, God knows where, somebody is studying in Singapore. And we have two daughters, both seem to be very happily pursuing their passion. I don't really know whether we've done right parenting, but it doesn't look like we've done anything wrong here. As a urologist and as a surgeon, and I see that in many of my colleagues who are high achievers, we want to be like Goddess Durga. For some of you who may not know who Goddess Durga is, this is the only goddess who has eight hands. And you know what each of that hand is doing? Each of that hand is wielding a different instrument and she's trying to do too many things simultaneously. Of course, being a goddess, I'm sure she makes gold with it. We all want to do that. So we want to be the best urologist, the best mom, the best parent, the best PTA attendee. We want to be the best friend for our friends. We want to wear the best clothes. We want to pursue our hobbies. So we land up being like this, a completely confused person who is trying to be jack of all, is tired doing all of this, maybe not exactly happy, but somewhere satisfying her ego that, well, I've been there, I've done that. And I think I'm really good. I think it's time that we took a pause. We asked ourselves. For me, I was planning my entire schedule around that elusive kidney which I have drawn. It's a line drawing that I have drawn. And inside that urology routine, I was fitting in my music, my reading passion, my shopping, my cooking, but everything depended on what the urology schedule for the day was. In the end, I would come home completely knackered tired, but I kept convincing myself that no, I think I've done the right thing. Now I have, after so many years, become wiser and I'm no more trying to squeeze everything around urology. It's okay if I'm not the best parent. It's okay if I'm not a high achiever on every front, but I take life as it is. I've started enjoying the journey and I'm actually smelling the flowers. So now I have made compartments. There is time for urology, there is time for shopping, there's time for music, time for cooking. And now there is a flower which I smell every day. 
And that I think is the biggest message that I would give to everybody. If you want to take urology, I think that's the ideal specialty. Do take that. It has the thrills, it has the frills, but celebrate your femininity. Remember, urology begins with you. You is the alphabet. You should be the center of what you want to do. Try and dabble at so many things, but try and find a balance. Talk to your family, take help. There is nothing wrong in taking help. Remember, urology is a teamwork. Raising a family is a teamwork. You, your husband, your in-laws, your parents, your friends, just lean in. Give them jobs to do and you can take that time out for yourself. It's okay if you're not good at everything. Your children actually are not going to remember that. But they will remember the special moment that you took the time out to spend time with them. I think that is what parenting is all about. I would like to thank I too, I would like to thank my family members, my parents, my in-laws, all my friends, and of course my children to be with me in this journey. I can't claim that I'm the best parent, but I do know that I've messed up several times. In fact, this was just for 15 minutes, but if it was to talk about the times that I have messed up, I would be having a webinar for three days, I think, and even that time would be short, but it's okay. I don't think I have any regrets. I've enjoyed every minute of being a urologist and being a parent. And I won't say that I'm a better parent because I'm a urologist, but I would say I'm a better urologist because I am a parent. This is my daughter. She is a vocalist. You can see her anywhere on the net. And she's single-handedly pursuing her passion. My other daughter is probably going to be an economist who is very interested in food and I won't be surprised if she opens the restaurant one day. We must have done something right. We must have done something wrong. Thank you so much again. I true. Aretha, I can say that you've certainly done more than something right. Uh, you know, that was a fabulous talk. Uh, I've been brought up by women of four different generations. And so I know the challenges that Indian women face. So, a big hand to you. I know that you've received a standing ovation for this talk. We can't do this on a webinar, but I'm sure every woman and every man is standing for that talk. Great talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to now invite uh, Ms. MC uh, for the next presentation. Thank you, uh, Ms. McDonald. Thank you, Jean. We can see uh, you're still on mute, Jean. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay, fine. Well, I'd like to thank the iTrue team, Bavin, Zisham, Baskar, for arranging this webinar and for inviting me to participate. So who am I? I'm Jean McDonald. I'm Jamaican. I'm a graduate of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Not moving. Trying to get this to move. Right. I graduated from the University of the West Indies and worked in the Bahamas for several years. I moved to Scotland in 1981 to do the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And I received that fellowship. And then I continued gaining experience in general surgery and urology and got the diploma in urology at the Institute of Urology in 1990. At that time, there was no FRCS urology, just FRCS general surgery. I was appointed a consultant urologist at North Middlesex University Hospital in 1995. 
And at that time, I was the first, well, I, I am the first black female urologist in the United Kingdom. It was 23 years later that there was a second black female consultant urologist appointed, and she was one of my former house surgeons. So I've served in a variety of roles, including clinical lead, deputy chair of the Medicines Management Committee, and various other surgical roles. And I established quite innovative programs, mainly because at that time, we didn't have a lot of urologists. And so to manage the workload, one had to get experienced nurses to actually be able to help with the work that we were doing. So I started out um, nurse-led urodynamics. I sent my specialist nurse down to Bristol so she could learn about what was happening and learn about how to do urodynamics properly and then how to actually read that. She st uh, also, she started having prostate clinics and erectile dysfunction clinics and later on nurse-led cystoscopy units. I'll, I've ha had regular visits to sub-Saharan Africa and I'll talk about that soon and I've done workshops in the Caribbean and all over the world. I've been a member of the board of directors and a member of the nominations committee of the Society International de Urology and I'm an honorary consultant on the Board of Trustees of St. Luke's Healthcare. St. Luke's Healthcare is a charity that looks after the Church of England clergy. So what happened? How did my charity work start? I love going to various conferences. I go to the SIU, to the AUA, the European Association of Urology Conference, and while I was at one of these conferences in 2004, I met a professor from Senegal, Professor Siringay. And he came up to me because, you know, we have there are lots of people there. And he said, are you a urologist? And I said, yes. And he'd never had seen a female urologist before. And he said, oh, oh, interesting. And then, he came to visit us at the North Middlesex Hospital and I've been visiting them in Senegal and we've set up a co collaboration between us. So we've collaborated in various conferences and um, they started this meeting called Eurodac and I would take my nurses with me, my specialist registrar and here we are at the hospital, the main hospital in Senegal, in Dakar. And there are my nurses and this specialist registrar at the time and another of my nurses. This nurse does her erectile dysfunction prostate clinic. So while we're there, we set up workshops. We've done workshops on transrectal biopsies, urodynamics, and it has been very rewarding being able to see urology in a developing country. We saw that instruments that we use for stones, which were single use instruments in the United Kingdom, they were being sterilized like the guide wires, the baskets. And we thought, how can we actually help? I find that in education, if one travels, and lectures and operates, you're able to input knowledge to many trainees. As it was very difficult for trainees to actually gain experience in developing countries. So we set up various workshops and here we are because at the unit in Dakar, it's actually a training unit for lots of places in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they're trainees from Nigeria, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, lots of other African countries, and they come there to gain experience. And at that, uh, at that hospital, they're always having various workshops with leading people from all over 
the country, all over the world. So prostate cancer in Africa, there's limited data, but we know there is increasing incidence. And when I went there initially, they were doing prostate biopsies by actually putting their finger up and actually doing biopsies that way. So it was very good for us to say, okay, do you have an ultrasound machine? And usually the gynecologists have an ultrasound machine and we could adapt it. So we could actually do transrectal ultrasounds at that time and actually be able to target tumors and actually do a better biopsy. So then we had trust biopsy courses and here I am at one of the courses actually training the professor of urology and there are lots of people around training the nurses as well how we do transrectal ultrasound biopsies of the prostate. I normally take my juniors on these conferences. Here is one of my registrars who was here at this conference and my uro-oncology nurse Juliana at the conference and we've had really good times in Senegal actually being there at the conferences and learning what it's like to practice urology in a developing country. Now there's something you, you need to understand. Um, urologists in some of the other African countries they were really surprised that there was a female who was doing this and they'd say oh why is she doing urology but then you break down these barriers and i do go to different meetings like pausa the pan-african urological association meeting so i was really surprised and glad when the association of surgeons of zimbabwe actually asked me to come and do a workshop there and they had a week of this workshop where it was called Prostate Cancer Week. And there were lectures by oncologists, by us, by nurses, to the general public, to actually also as well to other healthcare support workers. And then we had a lovely workshop there in Zimbabwe. Again, I've taken as well other urologist, one of my trainees as well, and my nurse histoscopist to Senegal so that we can actually share our knowledge there. But it doesn't mean that because we do some things in the developed world, they should not be exposed to this as well. So at, at the hospital, we were graciously treated and we met the CEO, the Minister of Health, and then Recently, I went back the last time was in February when we actually started telling them about transperineal biopsies. So I strive to make sure that they're kept up to date with whatever we are actually doing. They may not have all the equipment that we have, but they should know exactly what is actually going on. I, as I said, have participated in quite a few conferences. Here we are at the American Urological Association meeting with the people from PAUSA, Pan-African Urological Association, in combination with the Caribbean Urological Association. And here is Kurt McCammon, who is from Virginia, and he has been very active with IVU Med in actually going out there teaching reconstructive urology and we've always met out there. Now recently, Graham Watson, who is a urologist in Eastbourne, who also goes out to Sub-Saharan Africa and teaches PCNL, he wanted various urology units in the United Kingdom. He said to them, if you could keep your guide wires or your baskets, it would be really good because we could collect these used disposable and then we could actually sterilize them and they could be sent out to various units in Africa. So what's happening, he had Meditech Trust and what Meditech Trust has done is they 
leave one of these sharps bins. So we wash the instruments, we put them in there, and then they sterilize them and they send them to different units. And of course, the trust is not liable at all because they take the um, liability. So we've been doing that at the North Middlesex Hospital. I spoke to my microbiological colleagues and they were quite happy about this. And that's what has happened. I have received quite a few awards. The Caribbean Urological Association gave me an award in Jamaica because I've trained quite a lot of urologists who are now consultants in the in Antigua, in Jamaica, in St. Lucia. And it's so rewarding to see your former trainees doing very well in their positions as consultant urologists. The, this was a presentation from the Association of Surgeons in Zimbabwe. And there was I speaking when there was a citation that they did and they had me as their guest of honor at their conference. So in summary, it's been a bumpy road. I wouldn't say that it's been smooth at all. There are many glass ceilings, but one needs to persevere. I've had a rewarding career. I've met lots of friends and colleagues internationally. And I think it sums up, up the, the inscription on the presentation from the Association of Surgeons in Zimbabwe. It said, teach one, cure many. You have cured many in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Jean, thank you very much. Uh, we, I think we all really want to give you a big clap. Uh, and you've certainly cured many, but you've also taught quite a few. And all your trainees, we can see why they find you an inspiration. So on behalf of ITRU, we're really grateful. That was an absolutely inspirational talk. We are now going on to the poll, uh, going on to the next round. Pascal will be going on to the Q&A now. But if I can ask all the viewers, uh, to maybe minimize their media screen. And there'll be a couple of po co poll questions there. And we'd be very grateful if you could answer them uh, because it's helpful for us to know what your views on various subjects are. Bhaskar, over to you. Thank you, Bhavan. Uh, Jean, honestly, uh, the journey you have had is inspirational for many reasons. There's been many firsts that you have done, achieved, and the way you have taught the people is very inspiring and we can all learn a lot from you. I'm looking forward to meeting you in, in person, honestly. Moving on, I'm going to tell you one thing. The poll questions, there'll be 11 questions. You can take your time, but I think once the timer starts, you have 10 minutes to answer. That's for the audience. We will share the poll answers at the end. The top five questions are the most interesting and some of the chat questions that you would have asked. Uh, us to share with the speakers. I would also like to share, we have had almost 1,000 uh, registrations, people who are watching us. It is amazing. 65% of them are females, more than 20 countries. So kudos to all the viewers who have joined in. Of course, it wouldn't have been possible without our five-star speakers. So thank you again, everyone. Now I'm going to start uh, with uh, Anita, if that's okay with the first question. Nita, if you can unmute yourself, thank you. you. You know, medicine in India has still got a significant representation in women. However, the, the problem is urology compared to the Western world is, is very poorly represented as you have shown us. Do you think it's the nature of the speciality perhaps that makes it less appealing to Indian women? Uh, perhaps yes, uh, because the inhibition, I think, is largely in the mind of women. In my practice, I have never seen a man who is not wanting to come to me as a patient because I'm a woman. You get it? So Indian men, much against what everybody else might imagine them to be, are perfectly okay showing a lady doctor about their urine-related issues. And in fact, I think maybe I have a poker face when I talk to my patients and I ask them questions about uh, their sex life in some of the areas that I deal with, they are perfectly okay talking about it. And I've never found any reservations 
about any of the men so in fact i would urge indian women or lady doctors to choose urology as a specialty as i already mentioned in my talk and don't think that it's a difficult branch patients will come to you irrespective of their gender and i guess urology has so much to choose from you know you've not just got you've not just got the the surgical side you know you can do big surgery endoscopic surgery laparoscopic surgery you can do office urology there's so much to choose from so that is a perception and inhibition that must be overcome and we need to have more women in urology i think so baskar can i just add something you know mm-hmm. when men requiring prostate surgery and then i'm counseling them about its potential impact on their sex life and if they have been to another male urologist before and then have come to me they invariably say that but how come this wasn't told to me and i said why is that because i counsel them even before starting alpha blockers yeah. so i am a little surprised and if there is no male or female about it it's a reservation in our mind yeah. that we don't choose to discuss these topics because in our culture we think they are taboo i think it's about time we changed the definition of taboo uh, i agree thank you for that and hopefully we will have more indian urologists coming on the fore thank you Patricia, can I ask you something? I have known you through Europe. You are wonderful as a person, as a trainer. Now you are known to be an excellent trainer. But how did you recollect your trainers who inspired you, and what do you think you learned from them? Well, I think um, one of my big examples, um, Axel Bex. He is uh, a, a German from origin. He came to the Netherlands, and he's now. head of the renal cancer department of the royal free and um i have when i was in the dutch cancer institute uh, doing my residency he learned me a lot uh doing big surgery uh, laparoscopy at the time robotics and um um but most of all i think the the patient he had with training and mentoring and not giving any um um uh, judge about things um and giving you the space to to develop yourself with the uh, in the meanwhile trusting trusting you uh giving you the trust um as a, as a person i think that gave me the the best space for development um and furthermore i've have had several uh, trainers and mentors and i've been seeing also how not to train people so that gave me also inspiration of how i should not be a mentor or a trainer and that well actually altogether made made me as the trainer i'm now so i think patience is important and also giving them the space you know the, the trainee is a little bit of space yeah yeah okay thank you and hope all the the trainees are listening uh, and also the trainers to to try and help them So going on to you Jo how would you describe we all know you are a, a very successful leader but how would you describe your leadership style I uh, I I'd, I'd just like to say one thing before I answer that if I may I've been absolutely mesmerized by my fellow speakers so inspiring great work they've done so much work but such great orators and presenters it's been absolutely lovely I'm so glad to have been able to spend my saturday lunch time listening to you all it's been wonderful but not to detract from the question i don't know what my leadership style is i i do what i do i think that if you were on a leadership course it would probably be called a participative style that means i like to talk to people i like to network i like to listen to people and hear what they have to say i like to have different voices in the room um and i think as i've grown a little bit in confidence so through some of the things i do i particularly enjoyed including people in groups who have a different opinion to me because sometimes it's very easy to uh make a group of like-minded individuals who you know are going to agree with you but that's not going to be very successful and i actually think it's really important to bring people into the room who you know are going to give you a hard time um and then i i think a couple of other things enthusiasm energy always is valuable and i do value a lot body language 
looking at people it, it, even when in a large conference hall you can still see people's faces and 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 their body language and this is one of the downsides of these wonderful webinars in that i have no idea what those 905 people were doing they may have been asleep for all i know but yeah looking at people listening and getting a sense of the feeling in the room i i, I enjoy those things thank you joe and and we love your leadership style so thank you and i agree it's been inspirational to listen to all of you Jean, I'm going to come to you now. You are amongst the most senior urologists in UK and you're one of the most loved and respected. And I hope when I'm at your stage, uh, you know, I have the same uh, uh, trust and, uh, you know, respect from my trainees. How has British urology changed in this period? How do you think in your long journey, the British urology has changed? You're, you're on mute, Jean. Jean. Sorry. Right. Oh, how long do you have? <laughs> I have seen so many things. I remember when alpha blockers first came in to treat BPH and at Bows the room was totally filled because this was the medication that was going to put all urologists out of business. I've seen it. I have saw when we used to look after patients with erectile dysfunction, we were giving them injections and then the tablet came in, Viagra came in. That was a sort of monumental moment. Other treatments for BPH, because we only had transurethral resection of the prostate. I've seen them heat the prostate, freeze the prostate, do all these things, lift the prostate. There's so many options at the moment. Ureteroscopes, I remember when we first did a ureteroscopy, we were using size 13 ureteroscopes. I know you would all cringe at the moment, but you had to be careful. You went up with a size 13. I mean, we've gone all the way down size 7.5 and even smaller. PCNLs as well, we've gone into mini PCNLs. And of course, the, one of the biggest things has been the robot. So the robot has come in. We didn't have that many years ago. So these are the sort of, just a few of the things. I mean, I could be here for ages just telling you about how urology has changed over the years. But it's all been for the good. And, you know, it's really good to know that urology tends to lead the way in endoscopy, in everything, robotic surgery, everything. Urology has always been at the forefront of technology and just leading the way generally in surgery. And they're nice people as well. So I agree. Oh, yes, definitely. The best of the bunch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean. Amelia, I'm going to come to you next. You have, I know you have won two years in a row, the EAU Urolithiasis Award, and that is no mean achievement. Uh, you have got, I know, loads of papers in the last three years. What is your secret? How do you do it and keep doing it? Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. I am, uh, yeah, I think the secret is just the teamwork, or at least this is what has happened to me. So find and collaborate with a team which is very, very research driven, very enthusiastic and um, concentrated and focused on research and to finding and reaching a result. And this uh, most of the times comes with a publication of a paper and also is um, to have the, the background in the background, the family that supports you, that can accept that maybe you will a few times in the year travel to attend conferences and um, support you in that. And maybe that sometimes during your weekends or times off, you can dedicate some hours of your time off to finish that paper or to submit the abstracts <laughs> before the deadline. Uh, and this is, this is very important. All in all, this is uh, what makes the difference or at least it made difference to me. Thank you, Emilia. I, I know that is very important point, your family support. And I know you've got a very loving Brazilian husband. And yeah. he's wonderful. So, uh, the team working, I agree. And we work in the same team. And, you know, I couldn't have done without your help and support. So thank you. Bon, over to you. Nita, going on from family, if I could ask you. you. You're clearly a superstar functional urologist. How do you balance a family life and your professional career? 
um, am I audible, Bhaskar? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the answers are in all the slides which everybody else has given. And the answer is A, collaborate. B, it's a teamwork. And three, you must learn to delegate. Now, I must give 500 marks out of 100 to my husband, who's been, uh, you know, my team mate in this entire difficult balancing act, as people would call it. And there is nothing that he cannot do as a parent, which I do. So literally every, every job that we do is split 50-50. And there are days that I'm not at home. By the time I'm back home, the kids are sorted out. The meal is sorted out. Literally everything is sorted out. And I walk in like a queen supreme. And that wouldn't be possible if it hadn't been for his support. But also it's communicating with the children that they can't make undue demands out of us because it is physically not possible for us to be present there, opening their bag, removing the tiffin, asking them how the day was because we're really not present during that time of the day. So the children understand and that is because we have learned to talk to them, we've learned to listen to them. And I think if there is one message I would like to give everybody is please listen to their children. If you want to be a good parent, the trick of how to be a good parent comes from your children. Listen to them, they're giving you hints. So it's not a balancing act really. I think letting go, let things be out of balance, learn and accept it. It's not a race. You're not there to win. There is no time slot. Take it at your own pace and enjoy the journey. That is the best way to balance your career as well as your personal life. Simple as that. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could. Bhavan, you are on mute. Bhavan, sorry, you are on mute. If I, thank you very much, Anita. That was, that was really nice. Uh, Dean, uh, Miss McDonald, if I could go to you now. Now, one of the most obvious things is that your trainees love you. Do you think training is perhaps amongst the most fulfilling aspects of your job? Definitely. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. It's so rewarding to train people. You will sit behind them, they're doing a TURP, and your hands are literally wanting to actually do something. But you know, it's really good to be able to sit down and just guide them and encourage them. And I think that's what they appreciate. The other thing is take them to conferences with you, expose them to the rest of the world so they can have an idea of what goes on in other places. And it's amazing and it gives me great pleasure. And I'd like to be remembered actually as someone who inspired the next generation of urologists so that urology is in safe hands. I think you've absolutely done it. If I could go to Joe next. Joe, you will be our first vice president in Baus. There are a number of leaders, young aspiring leaders. Uh, what would your advice to them be? I think, uh, I should say, I'm, I won't be the first vice president of Baus. I'll be the first uh, female vice president of Baus, correct? There have been many excellent vice presidents of Baus before me and will be many after me. I think what I would say is um, what I said in my presentation, you choose things that interest you, do things that you enjoy and things that you're passionate about. Um, look for the opportunities where they might not naturally be obvious. So some things we do, particularly as trainees and also as consultants, where we might think that it's a bit pedestrian, a bit mundane, and I get trainees who talk to me about not really wanting to do audit and so on. These are opportunities. You've got to do the work, so you might as well enjoy it and make it something that, that means something to you. I think there's something to be said for look around and watch other people. I've worked with some excellent mentors throughout my career. You'll have met some of them as well, Bob and I know, and I've been inspired by many of them. And, and I don't seek to copy anyone but I have had the opportunity to look at things that I thought were done really well and uh, try to incorporate those into my way of doing things. But likewise, 
I've also had occasional opportunity to see things done extremely badly. And that was also a very good lesson for me. So watch other people, do what enjoy what you enjoy. Um, and you have to do things that you enjoy. You don't just work for the sake of it. All of us here have got, I think, work-life balance. And, and that's what keeps you going, keeps you fit, keeps you healthy, uh, as Patricia said. Thank you, Joe. That's awesome. Thank you. If I could go to Patricia next. Patricia, you've endeavoured on a career in minimally invasive surgery, upper tract. It's probably amongst the, the most challenging surgery to do. For the younger generation of women who want to pursue this kind of career, what would your suggestions be? Well, I think um, just, I think the most important thing is that doing this kind of complex surgery that always, you should always prepare yourself, uh, make the surgery for yourself systematic so that you know the single steps perfectly in your head. So be very systematic. Sorry, I think we've lost the audio from Patricia. Patricia, can you hear us? I think her screen is frozen. Okay, oh, we'll, we'll be just can... wait for Patricia to come back. I'll, if, Amelia, if I could ask you something, please. Amelia, you know, your journey is amazing. You've come from Italy, you've come to Britain, uh, and you've not just survived, you've excelled, you know, and your journey has been, is only just beginning. What do you think your biggest challenges were when you first came to Britain? Thank you very much, Bhavan. Well, well there, there have been a lot of challenges. Clearly starting a new job, a new life from scratch, showing every, every one of your colleagues and patients what you can and cannot do, show them your strengths. And... Um, I have to say, most of the time, these challenges have been an, an opportunities and also a new an opportunity to grow, to find out what I could do on my own or to find people who could help me to overcome the difficulties and I can now help someone else to, to go through the same I went through three years ago. And also it gives you the opportunity to make new relationships, which at the beginning is very difficult, but it's a great chance to meet wonderful people that otherwise you would have never met. So these are really important challenges I could have the luck to find. Thank you, Bhavan. Thank you, Amelia. While we wait for Patricia to come back, I've just got to thank the sponsors. So Sun Pharma, especially Vivek, Nayanar and Ashish here. Thank you very much for your support, uh, for providing us with the portal, with the technical support and also Heman from 24 Frames. We couldn't have achieved this without you. Almost 1000 uh, viewership, uh, which is just on this platform and of which 65% are females. This is excellent and I must thank uh, uh, you guys for doing an amazing job. While we wait for Patricia, Sishan, do we have the poll question answers? Yeah. If you can share the screen and I'll give that to you. So Zishan is going to share with you the five topmost poll questions. And if Patricia comes back, uh, Bhavan will ask her the question again because she couldn't finish her answer. So over to you, Zishan. Thank you. So meanwhile, we had uh, an audience poll where uh, we had almost 965 people who had answered and among them as sir said as dr basker said 65 percent were females and almost 62 percent from india followed by uk indonesia uae and almost 40 percent of them were consultants and 15 percent students and seven percent were residents Patricia is trying to log in and while she's doing it i have to say this has been one of the most wonderful and humble experiences in terms of all the webinars, you know, I know it's currently a webinar season, you know, it's like a pandemic of webinars, uh, but it has been an amazing learning experience. I'll tell you one thing, I'll be in trouble at home. My wife is going to expect a lot more from me now after attending this webinar. So I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing on a personal note, 
but this has been fascinating and wonderful. Thank you. Zishan, when we are ready, you can have it. Otherwise, if there is a problem, we can do uh, a, a, a verbal one where yeah. we can just ask the questions and answers. Meanwhile, I have two questions. I mean, so there were so many questions which were asked, but I thought we'll pick two of them. There was one question to Miss McDonald. It says, was the training of urological nurses reflected in other UK hospitals? Miss McDonald? It, it was because I started the first sort of urological nurses that training that we had because at that time I think it was um, the the company that did um, alfusacin that actually sponsored us and then the people that did tamsulosin next sponsored and then it was Muse that sponsored and gradually other hospitals started having urology nurses and now of course you know they have bone so there's a British Association of Urological Nurses at the moment. And I'm also pleased to say that in Sub-Saharan Africa, they are looking at um, nurses. I know when we first went to Dakar, because of course you remember that is French, and the French urologists were there and they did not like the thought at all of women actually, well, not even women, but of nurses actually doing the job that they saw as something that should be done by doctors only. But as I said, because in Sub-Saharan Africa, you haven't got that many urologists and you have quite experienced nurses. So you should share the whole thing. But I think they're worried that if you share, then these people, that's what one of the urologists said, oh, they'll go out to the village and start their own um, clinic. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Uh, meanwhile, there was one more question. I don't know if I should ask this. Does nepotism exist in neurology? This can be answered by anybody. So nepotism is where a family member, Joe, you please, you go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I would have to say, I don't think it's so common in the system in which I work in. I do think that there are colleagues who've been inspired by parents to join the profession, but I think that's quite different to nepotism. I understand nepotism is that you are given an opportunity because of being someone's son or daughter. Um, whereas I, I have seen uh, children follow their parents' footsteps, but I, I would like to think this is a, a thing that we can relegate to history. I hope uh, that's my experience. I don't know what others have to say on the subject. I would like to add something. I think I know this is very hot in Bollywood at the moment. This is where probably it stems from. Remember, in, in medicine, it is about hard work, dedication, skill, and passion. And, you know, it is very difficult. It's a five and a half year long journey. And I don't think, you know, you'll be successful or you'd enjoy it if you're pushed into it personally. No matter the connections can help you in the beginning. I can tell you, I came from a very small town or a village even from, from India and have trained in so, so many parts of India and then in 22 hospitals in UK. And I think, I've, I've, I think you know, I'm fortunate to be here. So it, it doesn't matter how well you're connected. I think, it, it, especially in medicine, I think more than anywhere else, I don't think it will work just with nepotism. Thank you, Dr. Basker. I have one more question. You want me to ask the panelists? Please, yes. What should we exactly do to bring women up front in medical field? So who would like to answer this question? What should we do to bring women up front in medical field? Uh, could, I, could I answer that? Yes. Okay, so I can only give an Indian perspective. And I would say the preparation for that starts right during the school times. You must open the eyes of the girl child and make her believe that she can do anything that she wants to. And so it doesn't start by the time you reach a point where you choose a career, but the children and the girl child especially must be taught how to dream big. And that sometimes in a scenario like India doesn't come so naturally. So I would urge all parents and all school teachers to inculcate this thought in their child's mind that yes, you want to be somebody 
it could be anything it could be doctor engineer lawyer advocate anything but dream big and don't think anything is impossible for you because you are a girl this thought is in your head everything is possible irrespective of your gender and not impossible because of your gender it's just my thought thank you can i say something i find that sometimes you do not realize the influence that you have just this week i had a letter from someone who did work experience when she was in school that's 12 years ago and she wrote and said miss fodal i'm sure you don't remember me but 12 years ago i did work experience in in your department and i'm pleased to say no i'm a fy1 doctor and it you you're just being there inspired me so you don't realize what you've done and you think what have i actually done but they see you they see you doing things and they decide well okay i will be a urologist or i'll be a doctor because it's possible once you've done it and if you continue to motivate them and say work hard and you can always achieve what you want to achieve i think patricia's back uh and uh she was in between answering the question on how can we inspire uh young aspiring women urologists to take up complex uh, robotic surgery patricia can i ask you to answer that please yeah thank you beth i'm sorry for my bad wifi here in um, in the netherlands but um uh, thank you for the question um well i think to start and to continue to be inspired for getting into lab robotic um you need to to go on and to you it, you you sometimes you fall but you you stand up and you go you have to continue um um and try to be relaxed and mindful and um i think in stressful uh, surgical operations you should have a plan be be prepared uh on the surgery work systematic and um don't be distracted by things happening around you so the focus is very important but if you want to if you really want to go for lab robotics or open surgery you need some um good nerves how do you how we say this in in, uh, in english <laughs> you need to 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 stand your uh, to your your, your uh, person yeah i think good nerves is a good word we all agree with it no problem at all zishan do you think we can get the poll results or do you think we should uh... Uh, would you like to announce the poll result yeah there was some technical glitch but i can answer one uh, there was a question which we asked what is the greatest challenge faced by leaders in medical field so the top answer was time management there's almost 32% of them said time management followed by lack of resources then 25% said coordination of work amongst members then patient distrust distrust was 7% assigning a task as per the ability of the worker or resident was 11% so the top answer for what is the greatest challenge faced by leaders in medical field was time management almost 32% i think all of us would agree with that joe i know you wear a number of hats what do you think finding time to do justice to a number of things that we do is that a particular challenge you would agree with as well yes i think so and uh, i think it is a, an art it's um when you try to juggle too many things you inevitably drop something and everything we do has impact on others so we have to try to deliver on each of these things so i guess uh, one of the things we haven't mentioned we've talked about taking opportunities but we haven't talked about learning to say no i find that very challenging i'm not very good at it um but it it is something that you have to sometimes say look i don't think i can do justice to that at the moment because i have too many other things going on and remember when you do that that means that somebody else will get that opportunity so i have found recently for example if i was not able to do something suggesting somebody who i thought had great potential to deliver as a person who might take that on works for everybody that's one of my solutions but i i don't have it cracked i i have not nailed time management you ask my department uh zishan i was just thinking that uh, we've now probably coming to close to the 
end of the webinar. And if we could ask all of our fabulous speakers to maybe give a concluding remark. It could be anything, any inspirational uh, advice to the women out there. So if I could start with Amelia, please. Yes, so I just want to say thank you very much for the iTrue group for organizing this amazing webinar. It worked really well and I learned a lot because I'm the last one arrived, the little fish of this amazing group of women that I learned from. And I definitely want to follow their advices. And um, yeah, my take home message would be women are definitely gonna have success in medicine and in urology and they just need to attend our departments follow us see what we can do see what the procedures we we do are and i'm sure we will they will definitely um take that as um as their objective because it's a fantastic specialty thank you very much thank you amelia Ms. McDonald. I would just like to say that women can do exactly the same things that gentlemen are able to do. Urology is a fascinating speciality and if they work hard at it, they will succeed. But be prepared that you're going to have challenges. You're going to have some people who won't like you doing the job that you're doing. But over the years, you develop a crocodile back and you sort of just go about your things quite easily. And then you get the reward when so many of your juniors just adore being around you and respond so well when they hear that you're anywhere or like with this webinar. And thank you all so much for making this possible. Joe? Thank you, Bevan. Um, I guess I should confess something. This is the first time I've engaged in an all-female panel. I've declined previous opportunities, uh, precisely for the reason I described in my slides. I, I thought it might have been in the past a little bit of tokenism, and I didn't really support that. But I have to say that um, I feel now I have a, I do have a role as a role model, and I, I do need to be supportive and visible in these things. And I have changed my view. This has been a very refreshing webinar. And I think this particular combination has made for a most refreshing uh, discussion all round. Um, what I would like to say is I look forward to phase two and that uh, many more talented women will appear in your panels for the expertise that they have as urologists. And thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, Owen, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, sorry, please. Patricia, if you... If Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I um, totally agree with Joe. This is also my first thing with female, only female. Um, but I think the main the message for me is try to be yourself, believe in yourself, and set a goal, set the goal, your goal, and try to focus. I think concerning uh, time management, the focus three to five uh, big projects, focus on that and the smaller parts will, will disappear uh, for, uh, in the time management. So um, that will, will be my message and thank you very much for, uh, for being invited for this nice webinar. Anita? Well, thank you so much, Aitru, for asking me to be a part of this wonderful webinar. I have learned a lot from my co-panelists. I would just give one message that uh, girls just go for it. Urology is the line for you and nothing is impossible if you put your mind to it. Let's remove these gender thoughts out of our heads completely. I think you are because of what you are and not because of your gender and that holds true whether it's in India, United Kingdom, America, anywhere. So just go for it and there is nothing like uh, loss of balance at work. It's in your head. There's nothing like difficult time management. It's in your head. Time is always there. We are not there. So let's make sure we are available during that special time and everything is possible. So all the best. Thank you again. 
Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. What I'd like to say is that uh, we titled this webinar as Today's Women, Tomorrow's Leaders. But what our panelists have shown us that they're not tomorrow's leaders, they are today's leaders. And, you know, you know, we have to give a big hand to all of them. This is just an absolutely fantastic, inspirational group of people. Uh, and we're very grateful for you to be part of this webinar. I'd like to thank a lot of people who've been behind today's webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank our industry partners, uh, Vivek Nayanar and Ashish Kher from Sun Pharma. Thank you very much. Heman from the 24 Frames. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you really, very much. Uh, to all our viewers, you've certainly been very engaging. Your questions were great. So thank you again very much for that. Uh, I, I would like to acknowledge our iTrue team because they worked tirelessly hard in the background. Zeeshan has done lots of work. This was his initiative. So thank you so, so much. There's Milap Shah, the, who's our urology resident. Uh, we've got Zeeshan. He's our medical student who's an aspiring neurosurgeon. And we'd hope that we can change him to become a urologist. Uh, we've got Nitesh, who's our IT engineer, who's an absolute, uh, you know, all our fabulous backgrounds and flyers are because of him. Uh, and we'd we'll also like to thank Shiny, who's all of these guys have done a great job. So to you guys, I can say that you can now breathe a sigh of relief. You've done a great job. Well done. Thank you again from my side as well. Sorry, I got disconnected. Bhavan, uh, to all the speakers, once again, don't think this is your last one. This is just the beginning. We will be inviting you again because you can't hide away. Now we know where you are and you have been wonderful. And if uh, any of the females uh, you know, want to see this or anyone else wants to see this, this will be recorded and we will be having uh, the, the, the link to that. Uh, over to you, Bhavan and Zishan. So finally, I'd actually like to thank Bhaskar. Me and Bhaskar were in medical school together in KMC Mangalore. We trained together in uh, Scotland and we've done lots of things together. And it's always great fun to do things together. And before I conclude, all of us in the panel, uh, Anne and the I2 team would like to thank every woman that has inspired her both at a personal and a professional capacity. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice.